Hello, welcome to Justice and Society Extra Lecture Number Two. In this lecture, we're going to look at two views on contract theory. In the entire social justice section of our textbook, we've talked a lot about contemporary views of contract theory, what it is, and how it would be implemented into uh, the theory of forming a just or unjust government. So now we're going to go back and look at two original documents from Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. First, we're going to look at Thomas Hobbes. So Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan, and it's a massive political philosophy tome. The first half developed his views of what social contract theory is and why it is necessary. Hobbes lived from 1588 to 1679. His work is very early modern. Remember, all the way back into the beginning of the semester, I gave you a rough division about the eras of Western philosophy. We looked a lot at the ancient Greeks, which is considered to be the beginning of Western philosophy. Then the next period was medieval philosophy, where um, religious scholars took the works of Aristotle and Plato and tried to reconcile them with their sacred texts. They were trying to blend reason with faith. But then, around the time of the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, uh, thinkers started to move a little bit away from melding reason with faith and theology and philosophy separated, as well as uh, science and scientific theorizing. So this is really right at the beginning. You can see that the language in the book, and if you want to follow along, our selection starts on page 669. It's written in Middle English, and it isn't always easy to follow. But Hobbes' work is foundational in political and social thought. Most people don't accept the conclusions he comes to. Uh, it's not really in our selection, but eventually he decided that the only way the social contract could be enforced well is to have a monarchy or a dictatorship. And we'll also see at the end that there are other criticisms of some of the conclusions that Hobbes came to but he was one of the first to formulate contract theory. And it's shaped the way people think and have thought about government for hundreds and hundreds of years. Still has influence today, but it's not incredibly a straightforward influence. So the selection we have is explaining what the social contract is, why individuals choose to live by it, and why they have to if they're rational individuals. Okay, so the first section in our book, starting page 670, is called Of the Natural Condition of Mankind as Concerning Their Felicity and Misery. So this is the state of nature that I've mentioned several times. So felicity just means maybe well-being or a good way of living, and of course misery is a miserable state. So what are human beings like? What is their nature? So do human beings have uh, an inherent nature that's like an essence of what it is to be human? And this would be what he thinks of as an original state. So where nobody is in a community, there's no government, nobody rules over anybody else. You, all you do with your life is try to gather resources and survive. Um, so this would be a kind of thought experiment. He says a little bit later that he doesn't think that there was a time that was exactly like this ever. So we think about it as, again, a sort of philosophical idealization of something that uh, human populations 
before cities, towns, aggregations of people, maybe hunter-gatherers. He would have never had access to that vocabulary, but we can think about it like that. How would people interact? How would people get what they needed to survive? He doesn't think there's any such thing as virtue in this kind of world. Everybody's just doing the same thing. Everybody is trying to get food and shelter and protection to stay alive. And he makes an argument that everybody is roughly equal. So he admits that some people are more quick-witted or intelligent. Some people are much naturally stronger than others. But he thinks that the band between the strongest and the weakest, and the smartest and the least smart, isn't all that wide. And there's some evidence for this, especially if every single person is on their own. You would have a very difficult time over weeks, months, and years being able to survive every single attack, uh, whether it be a uh, physical violence, or somebody trying to outwit you to take your stuff or, or take advantage of you in some way. <clears throat> there are no coalitions, no pacts, nobody is working together. It's always single individuals in this state of nature. So um, one key point is that if we're roughly equal in mental acuity, and this is going back to that ideal of what a rational person is. You are rationally self-interested. We all want what we need to survive, what we need to thrive. And using our reason, we're aware that every single other person has those same needs and wants. And if we're in a pre-contract state, we don't have any community or any agreements with anybody else. If you want something someone else has, there's nothing stopping you from trying to take it. So further, he says some people, as part of their personalities or their nature, desire, enjoy, and cultivate having power over others. So of course that's above and beyond what each person needs to survive, but it's been a demonstrated trait in humanity for all of recorded history. So we have two problems. Somebody who is in desperate need might be trying to take what you have, and there might be someone who's trying to accumulate power, whether through their wit and wisdom or through physical intimidation and violence. Okay, so we all know, using our reason and experience, that some people enjoy power. So the reasonable thing to do in that case is to protect yourself from those individuals. We're going to keep that on the shelf for a little bit because we're still all by ourselves, all in a state of nature with no contracts whatsoever. The third problem for these theoretical people surviving by their own powers alone is that Interaction with others for much of human experience is not pleasant. Um, he explicitly says at the top of 671 that people really don't like to interact with others if possible. And that's because social interaction leads people to feeling undervalued or disliked. He thinks that. When you interact with people, if they criticize you or show signs of contempt, that is so deeply disturbing. So you naturally kind of avoid it. Of course, we here see one of the earlier weaknesses in his argument, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. If we grant him his points, he thinks in this state of nature where everybody is working for themselves, There'll be a competition for resources. There'll be individuals wanting power and individuals wanting admiration. So that's the little add-on to that thing where when you're in a social group, if someone fe you feel that someone undervalues you, you are going to try and force them to 
provide you with admiration, um, either again through wit or through physical intimidation. Who knows, maybe not everybody is like that, but just like the people who want power, we know that there are people in human society that that's just part of their personality or makeup. They will start conflicts if they feel they're not ad admired enough. And he thinks, Hobbes, that is, that in this kind of world, everybody's poised to attack at all times. So uh, there's no safety for anyone, no trust between any individuals. This isn't even, no families even. That's a family as a kind of contract, even though you might think it goes deeper. Um, in this kind of argument, every single relationship with every single other person is uh, not guaranteed. And that's what he means by war of all against all. He acknowledges that people may not be physically fighting at all times, but they're in the state of mind or physical preparedness where anyone can attack or be attacked by others. So that's a state of war. If there's a war in your home country, you might not be a soldier, you might not always be fighting, but the environment is a lot different than one in a state of peace. Okay, so this is the social contract. We're all rationally self-interested. We can all come to the same conclusions about how life will be in this free state. Because I guess that's the positive side of it. If you have no contracts, you also have no obligations. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want. You have ultimate physical freedom. Um, remember that there's physical and psychological freedom, and we're mostly sticking with individual liberties as being freedom externally. So we all are rational, we're all self-interested, we can all understand that everybody else is rationally self-interested. So uh, we can all figure out that life will be pretty brutal if there are no rules. He goes on to list in pretty striking detail about how there'll be no industry, so no factories, no businesses, no farming, no building, so not even houses, you just have to struggle to find safety and shelter. No navigation, no technology, no arts, no written languages. If there's no communication, cooperation, and trust, life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, so we can all predict this as rational creatures. And because we can, we're willing to surrender our total freedom to do whatever we want with no rules, maximum individual liberty, in order to procure, excuse me, safety and produce it. We need some sort of power or force that's strong enough to ensure this. So we form governments. They impose rules, laws, and norms. So by definition, of course, this limits our individual freedom. We can never just go and take whatever it is that we want from others by whatever means we have at our behest. This is enforced by a legal system. So that includes psychological harms, where if you're rejected or ostracized from your community, physical harms like violence from law enforcement members or imprisonment a total removal of all individual liberty. So um, he sort of anticipates one criticism a little bit. I think this is right on the beginning of page 672. He thinks the fact that even under the social contract, we take precautions. We lock our doors and we buy safes and we carry weapons or we practice our physical fitness in case someone attacks us. That's proof that we don't have trust for our fellow man. And while that is, of course, true, the idea that that proves that there's no trust ever in any situation might not be the best argument. So 
every rational individual wants one protection from death. Remember, that's on a right schema. If you think that there are human rights, that's number one. Everybody has right to their own body and mind, and nobody has a right to take that away from you. Everybody wants protection from death. Everybody wants their basic needs met. And everybody, and this is the key one, that you have to think a little bit as a rational self-interested person. You need the kind of world or environment where you can use your own labor to meet the first two desires. If you don't have protection from death, and if you don't have your basic needs met, you'll never be able to lose, use your abilities, skills, powers, your intelligence, your, your knowledge, your training. You'll never be able to use that to get your basic needs met. Um, only a government, Hobbes thinks, can carve out this kind of oasis from the natural state of life, the war of all against all. I'm going to wrap up this part here, and I move on to part two.